everyone. I'd like to welcome you. Oh, wait a minute. I'd like, like to welcome you to the Urban Wood webinar. The North Carolina Urban Wood Group. Um, my name is Mindy Heidenfelter. I coordinate the North Carolina Urban Wood Group, and I'd like to welcome you today. Um, we will be getting started in just a second here. I just want to let you know if you're having any technical difficulties um, that you think we might be able to help you with uh, with the webinar, go ahead and type that into the question um, section on the sidebar there on the right. Um, also, I want to mention to you that we. Um, have been granted uh, one uh, CFE continuing education credit. If you're looking for that, if you uh, with the Society of American Foresters, we will give you that information at the end of the webinar. So please, at the end of the webinar, be sure to um, complete the survey. Um, and then at the end of that, we will go ahead and collect your information for that credit. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I just wanted to um, review real quick the purpose of the North Carolina Urban Wood Group with you. Um, the, the North Carolina Urban Wood Group's purpose is to develop connections and provide up-to-date information and resources through a network of all aspects of urban wood utilization in North Carolina. Our partners work towards developing uh, a market for high-end products that divert removed wood from landfills into the hands of consumers in North Carolina and beyond. If you have any questions or want to get in contact with us, I left my um, email address there at the bottom. And so now I'm going to go ahead and um, put on our, we have a couple of quick poll questions just to kind of get an idea of um, of who all is on our call, on our webinar today and your connection with Urban Wood. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, let's see here, launch our first poll question. Let's see, you should have that up there on your screen. If you don't mind, go ahead and, um, go ahead and click on what your role is in the urban wood ecosystem. And if you're not involved, you can just go ahead and click on other and um, you could just be curious or just interested in hearing what we have to say today. You can type that over in the question box if you'd like. And I'm gonna give everybody a second here um, to respond to our first poll question. Okay, I'm just gonna give everybody one more second here. And let me go ahead and see, close that poll. And let's see here, we have Looks like 20% um, of the people on our poll um, are in the design professional building industry, 17% uh, sawmill and other supplier, and 20% of the people responded that they're an arborist or municipal worker. We also have some utilization foresters on here. We have one more quick poll question we'd like to ask. And this one is, we'd like to know, um, what are you hoping to learn today from our webinar? Um, and we'll have the speaker introduce himself in just a second. We're just curious to see um, what kinds of things you're hoping to learn today. Give you one more second. Let us know what you're hoping to learn today. Like we have most people have voted. All right, let me go ahead and close that one. Um, there we go. Okay, we got this one, one up and now I don't have to read it out loud. Um, so about 30% are hoping to learn about the urban wood industry. We have about 48% want to learn about wood processing and some people are interested in interacting with others in the urban wood chain. All right, great. Thank you for helping us out with that. 
And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this presentation over to Avery Earwood, who is the owner and operator of Wild Edge Woodcraft. He'll be our presenter for today. I'm gonna go ahead and let Avery introduce himself. Take it away, Avery. All right, great, thank you very much. And um, maybe if you can confirm that you can hear me okay. Yes, Avery, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'll steal the mouse back from you. Here we go. So, uh, as many mentioned, I am the owner of Wild Edge Woodcraft. I spend my days harvesting trees from the urban forest and transforming them into Wild Edge furniture. Uh, we also sell hardwood slabs and uh, provide vacuum drying services to other woodworkers. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I've spent the last 25 years as an overweight corporate consultant and executive. Uh, spent most of my time uh, during that time in, uh, in airports and hotels and on airplanes. Uh, so I'm very happy to say that now uh, my life has taken a dramatic change, what I think for the better. I spend most of my time outdoors now. Uh, in trees or around trees and working with wood and uh, getting dirty so i i've exchanged my my suit for my and, and dress shoes for some work boots and uh, my getting dirty clothes so that's a little bit about me i have been doing carpentry as a hobby or as a side business for pretty much my whole life my grandfather was a master carpenter in tennessee and I apprenticed uh, in his shop when I was a young lad. Uh, every summer I spent most of the summers uh, following him around and trying to learn what I could from him. And that gave me the love of carpentry and woodworking. And uh, you know, now at you know, almost 50, I'm finally sort of following my life's passion, which feels good. Um, you know, every day is an adventure. It's both exhilarating and terrifying to to be starting a small business in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm hoping for the best. Uh, I say all this just to say that um, while I have some knowledge to share, I don't consider myself an expert in the field. There are many of you who are probably in the audience today who could probably teach me a lot about this industry, um, but I'll share with you my perspective and hopefully it uh, provides you guys uh, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, interesting knowledge. I'm going to cover a lot of territory today, which means I'm going to probably stay at a pretty high level. We're not going to get down into the details of any one particular area, but I will share my contact information at the end of this, as well as being able to take questions throughout the presentation and at the end of the webinar. But if you're interested in learning any more or going into depth about any of the topics that I cover today, I would love to connect with you offline. Um, and if you're in the local area, I would also like to host you, uh, host a live tour here at the farm. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself or about our business. Wild Edge Woodcraft is part of Serenity Meadows Farm. 10 years ago, my lovely wife of 26 years and I started an alpaca farm here in Rougemont, North Carolina. And about half of our 25 acre farm is covered in what we would call old growth hardwood forest. So my plan when we started the farm was to harvest timber from our land and use it to build the barns and other structures here on the farm and then also turn the hardwoods into furniture. So following that passion, um, I've done that. And uh, in the process, uh, realized that there are more trees available in the urban forest than are available in uh, my little farm. And uh, I sort of have a passion for recycling. And so I I started going down the path of trying to understand what, uh, what it would mean to harvest trees from our urban forest. And when I use that term, just in case you're not familiar with it, uh, the urban forest, different than the rural forest, is you know, trees that are growing in our neighborhoods, cities and neighborhoods. 
and, you know, in the in the front yards and backyards of people's homes. So that's a little bit about the business. We I have three sons, and we moved out here with the idea of teaching our boys self-reliance and independence and the skills of everything from raising your own food, raising animals, and doing carpentry, plumbing, electrical, things of that nature. Um, so that's that's the, the family business in a nutshell. Uh, so let me pause for just a second and see if anybody has any questions. I doubt there are any yet, but um, if you do have questions, you can type them into the chat and Mindy will pop in and, and get my attention. Avery, it looks like um, we don't have any questions right at the moment. So um, I would say go ahead. Okay, great. So we'll just, so everybody's sort of familiar with the wood industry as an industrial ecosystem, right? Large scale logging operations, highly mechanized, heavy equipment. We all have seen the log trucks driving around. Um, a lot of the wood that comes out of our, you know, this kind of harvest process, the logging industry, is actually shipped overseas and is processed in big factories, in uh, highly automated factories, and then comes back to us in the forms of goods and services available in our retail stores. And that's not the industry that I consider myself participating in. Um, I consider myself part of the urban wood value stream. Uh, and I like to talk about that as, as being able to take, uh, complete the whole process from tree to table. And you probably always, you, you've heard this term farm to table. Well, I, I think about it as tree to table. So it all starts in the urban forest, you know, the, the neighborhoods and cities. And the harvesting of trees from the urban forest is very different than harvesting trees, obviously, from rural forest. And so I'm going to talk about that, what's different and what it takes to do that. Um, transport is different. Uh, then the sawmill application is different. Um, uh, the process of then turning in milled, uh, the milled raw material into a finished product uh, through the air dry, vacuum dry, you know, the crafting process, and ultimately it, putting something in the hands of the customer. So I'm going to cover each step in this process, how uh, the equipment you need and how I perform the functions within this step. This is not to say this is the only way, the right way. It's not even to say that you can't participate in, in different parts of the value stream. In fact, I think most people find a niche and a, and a specialty and play their role in and live in one or more of these parts. Um, but very, very rarely to, is it done probably all under one roof. But because it is a cottage industry, and that's, that's how I'm set up, is to actually do this from tree to table. That's what I'm gonna share with you today. So we'll start with the infrastructure, the facilities, equipment, and tools that are necessary to do, uh, to complete this value stream all under one roof. And I'll start it about four years ago when I bought this uh, timber harvester bandsaw mill from a Mennonite farmer in Ithaca, New York. So that was quite the adventure. I had actually never driven a skid steer in my life, and I bought the skid steer from the same gentleman, uh, and it came on the back of the same truck. So we drove it off, and then we used it to unload the skid steer. And, uh, and, and then from that point on, it has been an adventure and a learning curve, a steep learning curve every day since. Uh, the other, you know, once you have a sawmill and mine's electric, it's not portable. So it, I needed a place to put it. So I had to build a lean-to next to our shop. And once you have a sawmill, uh, you realize pretty quickly that you're producing a lot of a lot of boards that need to be dried before they can be used and worked into furniture. So I uh, decided to invest in a kiln. And I started by building a solar kiln because I was you know, trying to do this on a budget and be very cost effective. Uh, learned pretty quick that a solar kiln wouldn't keep up with the uh, capacity that I wanted to use um, or that I needed to run a business. 
And so I decided to invest in what's called an iDrive vacuum kiln. And spoiler alert, that's the iDrive being delivered. Um, and uh, it's a 15,000 pound piece of equipment that we had to rent a crane. And then we pulled it off the truck and um, then put it on the back of my trailer and drove it you know, from the local church parking lot to my house and unloaded it again, moved the crane and unloaded it uh, the second time. So I'm trying, there we go. So this is a picture of the crane putting it in place. And then we built the, the cover, the building, if you will, around the kiln. I couldn't figure out a way to get a 15,000 pound piece of equipment in a building. So we decided to set it on a concrete pad and build the building around it. If I ever get a second one, I don't know how I'm gonna put it in the building. Uh, the other pieces of equipment that you need because you're dealing with pretty heavy, uh, you know, pretty heavy raw materials here uh, are skid steer or tractor. Um, I happen to have one of each, which works well for me um, because I can take one to a job site and use it to load my trailer, bring the, the, the trunk home and use the other one to unload. But, you know, certainly I know a lot of people who, um, who don't have two. And so, but you do need, you do need something to be able to pick up some pretty heavy logs. Um, you can see the dump trailer and um, this uh, little Yale walk behind uh, that I bought uh, from, from a Walmart auction is very handy for moving heavy stuff around in the shop and in the storage barns. The other facility or piece of equipment you need is just a workshop space. So I uh, happen to have this building uh, on the property when we moved in. And so I claimed it as my shop. And I remember telling my wife at the time, because it was the largest shop I had ever had, that I said, I'll never need a bigger shop. And uh, fate laughed because uh, many, many times since then I have complained that I am out of room and I need more space. Uh, the other sort of hand tools that are necessary, you know, if you're going to harvest trees from the urban forest, you need uh, you need a chainsaw, you need uh, woodworking equipment like joiners and planers and band, uh, belt sanders, and you need a really good moisture meter uh, because moisture is the you know, probably the number one thing we have to deal with when processing wood from tree to table is you know how do we deal with the moisture in the wood, uh, getting it dry enough to work and then keeping it dry through the finished process. So that's basically the infrastructure uh, required. Uh, with one last thing, you need space to store all of these logs um, until they can be processed. And then you need space to store the, the milled lumber until it can be turned into product. So I'm just going to play this and solicit any questions. And this is just a walkthrough of our log yard. And I apologize for the video quality. I'm just basically holding my, my phone as I walk through the log yard. Uh, we've tried to organize the logs by species. Uh, we harvest a lot of local, you know, everything local. So we have walnut, as you see there. We have red oak, white oak poplar, sweet gum, pine, cedar, a red cedar, uh, maple, and hickory for the most part, and, oh, and pecan. Uh, those are sort of the main, the main ones that we have here. Every now and then I'll get my hands on a piece of sycamore, which is really great, um, but I don't have very much of that. So while this sort of finishes out, uh, I'll just solicit to see if there are any questions about what I've covered so far. Um, yes, Avery, we do have one question from Tom Dwyer. He'd like to know, isn't it important to keep logs up off the ground to prevent mold staining? Uh, yes, it is. And so you'll see some of these stacks are temporary, um, but most of them we've got, uh, 
We've got bunks, so some of the pine logs, some of the smaller pine logs, we put down and we stack the other logs on top of them. Uh, but yes, it is ideal to get them up off the ground uh, so that they're not absor absorbing moisture. It's really ideal to process the logs quickly uh, within a couple of weeks or months of taking them down. Uh, unfortunately, you know, being a, a, a one person operation, I am way behind in processing my logs and milling them. Um, I do get help from friends uh, uh, from time to time, but for the most part, it's just me. And so what you see is the accumulation of about a year's worth of harvest, um, but not very much milling. Um, I'm, I've been keeping up with custom milling orders, but I haven't been milling for myself. I'm hoping that things have slowed, the tree service uh, part of the business will slow down during the winter and will give me a chance to catch up on some of this uh, saw milling. All right, um, similar to what you were just mentioning, uh, we have another question, do you saw to stock inventory or custom job? Uh, I do both actually. So the idea is to, um, to mill both for, I'm trying to get this thing, there we go. Um, oops. Sorry, I, I mill both for, you know, do custom milling. So if somebody brings me a log and asks me to mill it for them and dry it or just mill it, I do that. Um, and then I also sort of speculatively uh, take take wood that is either been, I've either been paid to remove it from somebody's yard or I pick it up because it's been offered to me for free or I've harvested it from my property. And then I will mill that as well and then make uh, make that available for sale either as green slabs or I'll dry it and make that available as dried slabs or I'll go all the way and, and turn it in, into a tabletop and make that available as a finished product. All right, we have another question here. Um, why did you have to transfer the kiln from the truck to your from their truck to your truck instead of having it delivered to your site? That's a great question because I didn't think far enough ahead and actually plan for getting the uh, that size crane into my property. So the crane showed up and he, uh, well the crane could get in but the uh, delivery truck couldn't. And so rather than block the the highway or the road in front of our house uh, for an hour. Um, I decided to, we ran down the street to the to the local Baptist church parking lot and we were able to do the transfer there. And fortunately my trailer was just strong enough to, to be able to carry it um, the two miles back to the house in order to to get it into the, you know, far enough into the property where the crane could set it down. We actually ended up having to move the crane like four times in order to get it where it needed to be so um, but that that was a failure of planning on my part okay avery we just have a couple more questions before you move on um one person would like to know how do you end coat logs and the other person would like to know how long did the solar kiln process take to kiln dry and what moisture content were you able to regularly achieve um, I do coat the logs if, sometimes, um, I should coat them. In fact, that's the best practice is to, to coat with anchor seal or some other latex sealant to slow the drying process. Um, I'll admit that uh, sometimes I don't, uh, either because I don't have time or because the logs have been down for more than a few days. Uh, when they're offered to me, in which case it doesn't do any good to coat the coat the logs, uh, coat the ends. Um, in terms of the solar kiln, I never actually finished the solar kiln because I, I was about halfway through the build when I decided to go ahead and you know upgrade to the vacuum kiln. But um, and the reason for that was that the solar kiln takes several weeks to several months to dry 
uh, after wood has been air dried for you know as many as two years. And because I deal mostly with thick material that's two and a half to three inches thick, it takes three years of air drying plus another three to four months in a solar kiln. That's just a lot of time and I would need either a very large solar kiln or several of them to process to achieve the same throughput as I can get with the vacuum kiln. A vacuum kiln will dry air dried lumber in uh, two weeks, uh, one week per inch of thickness. So it's a much faster uh, and, and very reliable way to dry the wood. So I get a lot more throughput with the, uh, with the vacuum kiln. And I typically take it, so if you air dry it down to 20%, I'll typically uh, finish it off in the kiln down to anywhere between six and 10%, depending on what I'm building or what my clients are looking for. Um, we just have one more question. Um, although a vacuum kiln is faster, does it risk more warping and cracking? Uh, not in my experience. Um, now, certainly, you know, if you throw green lumber in the vacuum kiln and turn it on high, I've heard from other iDry owners that um, that the accelerated drying and heat can uh, cause excessive cracking or what's called honeycombing of the wood. I haven't personally experienced that. Most everything that I've dried has been air dried. Um, and that's really only an issue with the red, red and white oak and some walnut. Um, maple and some of the other species are more forgiving uh, in, in the way that you dry them. So they can, they can actually be dry. They can be put in the kiln with a little bit higher moisture content and they don't take as long to air dry as the oaks do. So um, we'll, I'll keep going and then uh, as more questions come in, I'll pause between each section. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the urban forest and, and harvesting in the urban forest. Uh, so I mentioned to you that, that we have some, uh, about 15 acres of hardwoods here on our farm and I do harvest uh, selectively I had the North Carolina Forestry Service uh, come out and walk the property with me on three different occasions. And we developed, or they developed a, um, a forestry management plan that I follow for um, the health of the forest and sustainable harvest. And uh, I'm learning a lot through that process uh, under the expert guidance of foresters from the North Carolina Forestry Service. I highly recommend anybody who's managing Timberland to go through that process. It's very inexpensive and it's extremely, you know, it's extremely valuable. Um, the, the amount of knowledge these guys have is tremendous. And it's, it's I, I feel uh, to be a responsible landowner that that's an important part of, you know, what I do in the, you know, urban wood ecosystem. Uh, that being said, I am harvesting mostly from urban neighborhoods now. Um, so this was sort of by accident. I never planned to get into the tree service business, but I had so many people calling and asking me to please come and take down their trees and uh, to do it safely and economically. And since there's a value proposition for me, I'm able to do that at you know a little bit of a discount compared to um, what another tree service who might not be using that wood or might actually be paying to somebody to haul away that wood. Um, but obviously that's a niche too because if the wood isn't of sufficient value or quality or if the tree is already dead, it's not something that I can use. Um, but that being said, um, I, we, we've begun to do this process of, of you know, we're calling it the tree service part of that value stream and um, in the process, we have been able to collect, as you saw from my log yard, quite a few trees um, at a very low cost of acquisition. Uh, I think this is an important, this is actually a critical part of the urban ecosystem because homeowners don't have a lot of options. You know, frankly, unless the tree service um, has a sawmill in there as part of their equipment and their business model, 
they're they're in a position of really needing to haul the haul away the waste what, what becomes a waste product and either pay to to dump it somewhere like one of the the county landfills or they're taking it back to their property and dumping it and uh, it's just rotting in the woods or it's being burned um, so uh, and, and mainly because the industrial logging environment doesn't have a good way to process these logs they don't want these logs because they're either too big too short they're not delivered in a way that they can easily be unloaded and put into their equipment or because they have metal in them. And so um, it's sort of really important that tree services and sawmills get together and work collaboratively to, to strengthen this value stream, to make these connections so that the, the sawmills are able, you know, the, the portable sawmills and the small sawmills uh, like mine are able to get our hands on on the wood in you know as cheaply as possible anyway so so we go out and get it and, and sometimes we're lucky enough to actually be paid to take the wood down uh, transport is probably my biggest challenge and so um, the equipment required to transport can be significant uh, here's a short little video of um, a tree service this is chip from chipmunks tree service in uh, henderson and he's taking down some very large oak trees at the Masonic Home for Children in Oxford. And I'm working with the home to turn some of their trees into memory wood tables. I'm doing this as part of a charity to help them raise money for the home. And uh, Chip very kindly agreed to you know, spend a little extra time after taking the tree down um, using his equipment, his crane, to to load the tree onto my trailer. The reason this is important is that that piece of wood that you see there in the video weighs over 10,000 pounds, much bigger, uh, much too heavy for even my large skid steer to pick up. And so I have to load it on the trailer and then take it directly to not my sawmill, but another sawmill. Um, it's actually Murdoch's sawmill in Bonn, uh, he's got a very large sawmill that can cut a six foot wide oak uh, or a six foot wide trunk. And so I take the really big stuff over to Jack and he mills it for me and then I go get it and come back. Um, so that's that process. Let me see if I can have a little trouble advancing these slides once they're in video mode. I'm not really sure why. Okay, here we go. Um, but if it's not that if it's not that big, and I can pick it up with my tractor or skid steer, I'll load it in the back of my jump trailer or on the back of our flatbed trailer and bring it back to the sawmill. That's sort of the ideal ideal situation. In a few cases, I actually have tree services such as Chris Johnson's uh, Johnson Tree Experts and uh, Scott Benjamin the local tree services that will bring the logs to me rather than take them to a landfill. And um, that's, that's a service to the client. It's also a service to society and our economy, or not our economy, but the ecology, right? Um, because that, that way, you know, something valuable comes from this wood product instead of it going to waste. Uh, but that's fairly rare because I'm, I'm not exactly convenient um, to you know to to the metropolitan areas out being in Rougemont I'm about a 30 minute drive from from Durham about a 45 minute drive from Raleigh so um, I don't get a lot of tree services voluntarily dropping them off it just happens to be the ones that are local will do that um, once it is here, then there's the process of unloading it. So loading it at the site and then unloading it. Um, so as you can see here, this is why having you know, some heavy duty equipment is important um, because then you can take it and uh, move it around and put it where I need to. What, what I didn't understand when I started this was just how much handling would be involved. I mean, so it's, it's handling and transport, it's, it's unloading it at, into the log yard, 
It's then moving it around the log yard as we reorganize the log yard. Um, it's then moving it from the log yard to the mill and then milling it and then stacking and stickering it and moving it into a dry facility, moving it from the dry facility to the kiln, moving it from the kiln back out to a dry facility, moving it from that dry facility back into the shop to be worked or to a customer site. Just a lot of handling of the equipment and that's just part of the business. Um, and, and so that, that was sort of a surprise to me exactly how much of that would be uh, or how much of my time and energy would be spent just moving the, the wood around. And again, we're talking about very heavy uh, raw material here. So a typical white oak log will run about three to 6,000 pounds uh, green. And even, even a milled slab, a two and a half inch thick milled slab, eight foot long, three foot wide, can weigh several hundred pounds, you know, much more than I can pick up by myself. So I'll pause there. We're about, uh, we have about 20 minutes left in the presentation and I, I still want to keep going, but are there any questions so far? Um, Avery, we do have um, a couple of questions here. Um, Roy Lynch would like to know, do you air dry completely before putting in the vacuum kiln? Um, I like to. It's certainly the most economical way to dry wood is to air dry it down to what you would call, you know, outdoor equilibrium, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 22 percent. Um, sometimes I have clients who need it faster than that, and so we'll put it in the kiln and try to accelerate the process. Um, but it does, you know, the wetter it goes in, the longer it takes in the kiln and the more energy it requires to dry and therefore the more expense involved in drying. Uh, if it's a high value piece of, of uh, wood, like, you know, a walnut or ambrosia maple or bird's eye or fiddleback or something, you know, high, highly valuable piece of wood, the cost of drying is well worth the investment. Um, I wouldn't probably do that with you know, poplar or pine um, just because the, the cost of drying would, would rapidly exceed the value of the, of the finished product. All right, Avery, thanks. Um, we have, um, let's see, um, we, Mark would like to know what are the benefits of vacuum drying over heat drying? Okay, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit when I get to the kiln section. So um, thank you for that question, and, I, and I'm going to just ask that we hold that answer until we get there, and I'll, I'll be sure to cover that. Okay, we can do that. Um, and then your trees are often yard trees, which often contain nails and other metal. How often is that found? Um, it's almost every yard tree that I, that I cut into has metal in it. It surprised me how much metal. I don't know what it is about humans. We just love to to nail things in our trees, I guess. Uh, and even the trees I pull off my property or local rural properties have metal fencing. You know, oftentimes they're they're at the edge of a pasture and the fence has grown or the tree has grown around the fence. So I hit metal fencing. I hit a lot of bullets. Uh, it's not too bad to hit a steel bullet. I mean, a lead bullet, but a steel bullet is um, can can be damaged to the tree. And then I find other things, tools and shotgun barrels and, you know, like somebody just stuck something in the crook of a tree and forgot about it, you know, a, screw, a full-size screwdriver in the middle of a tree. Um, so it happens all the time. If there's If there's a human near a tree, it's probably got metal. All right, so let me talk about the sawmill since we're, you know, sort of moving in that direction. Um, sawmill technology has evolved quite a bit since the good old days of the pit saw, where you put a guy down in, in the pit and one guy at the top and you push and pull until the log was cut. Uh, chainsaw mills are pretty popular because they're inexpensive, very accessible. Uh, the, the problem with the chainsaw mill is it's, it's slow and it's a lot of work. Circular saw mills have been sort of the go-to for the industrial saw, sawing capacity. Uh, the problem with them is that they're very expensive. Um, they're uh, 
they require a lot of energy to run, uh, steam power or, um, or electrical, and they're also extremely dangerous. Um, so, so circular saws aren't, you know, ideal for sort of the small, uh, small cottage industry like mine. Uh, but band saws are great. Band saws are fairly low cost to operate. Uh, the bands themselves cost anywhere from thirty to one hundred and fifty dollars, um, and they're pretty safe. Uh, been operating mine, like I said, for about three years, and um, while I've broken a lot of blades and I've hit a lot of metal with blades, um, there at no point did I ever feel like the the machine was going to eat me or, or cause any kind of physical damage. Uh, where I couldn't say the same about the circular sawmills that I've that I've been up up close and personal with. Uh, so that being said, my saw is, uh, as I mentioned, a timber harvester band mill, and um, it's it's not a wide mill, unfortunately. I wish I had a wide mill, but uh, it was designed for uh, timber frame making, you know, cutting wood for timber frame barns and timber frame buildings. And so it's sort of extra long. It, it can cut a 27 foot log up to a 24 inch wide and 24 inch thick uh, cans. And so uh, that's what I use. And like I said, if, if the log is bigger than what I can fit on my mill, then I send it over to Jack and Jack does a great job, um, very cost effectively milling uh, my wide slabs for me. Um, I'll just show you a quick video. This was one that Mindy took of the sawmill in operation. Uh, here we're cutting uh, a walnut log. This was a yard tree and it did have metal, but we were able to find it and pull it out. Uh, speaking of metal, I do one of the pieces of equipment that is you know, vital for this kind of processing is a good metal detector. And so we, we I, I got to the point where it's just habit now. You've got to check the log and you try to dig it out. If it's a high value log like maple or walnut um, or a good size oak, it's probably worth the time to dig out the metal or cut around it. Uh, if it's a pine log, I'm less inclined to do that just because I I can spend hours digging, uh, you know, digging a few nails out of a log. And again, the, the, you sort of have to balance that is the end product worth, you know, is, is the juice worth, worth the squeeze? Uh, so that being said, you'll, you'll see here's a picture of, you know, a couple of pictures of me digging, uh, digging metal out of the log. Uh, in the, the case of the lower left, I actually didn't find the metal with the bandsaw, uh, but I found it with my planer, which is almost worse. Um, but fortunately, it was a small nail, and I was able to, to dig it out and save the piece, uh, this mantle, this hickory mantle for a client. Um, just a few more pictures uh, of the bandsaw mill and my son making a, a silly face. But uh, one of the things I love most about this work, in addition to all the different wonderful people I get to meet and the variety involved in the work uh, and the fact that I get to use really cool tools, uh, one of the best parts is just opening a log. I mean, it's like Christmas. Every time I cut into a log, I get this feeling of anticipation and then of satisfaction in seeing uh, seeing what's inside that log, seeing the grain patterns and, and the potential for this you know, log uh, to be something beautiful. And every now and then, yeah, I'm disappointed. I open up a log and it's rotten inside, but I'm finding it even, you know, with the right amount of epoxy, even a, a, a rotten log can be beautiful. Uh, so, you know, that said, a uh, couple of techniques in, uh, in sawing, and I realize we're sort of running short on time, so I'm gonna go quick. Um, this little video, I'm just sort of describing that when you have a check in a log, and a check is a crack that happens when it's drying, you know, the ends dry faster than the core, uh, you want to try to orient the log on the mill such that you're capturing as much of that crack, or at least the biggest crack, in a single slab so that you're not, uh, you know, if, if I had turned this log 90 degrees, 
Now, every log that came off this uh, particular, or every board that came off this log would have that crack in it running right down the middle of the board. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of important is to read the log, understand, you know, the bow, the twist, where the tension in the log is going to be. You know, if the log was a heavy leaner when it was growing, then it's going to have a lot more tension on one side of the log than the other. And when you go to cut it, you need to take that into account because it's either going to bow or it's going to uh, bend. Um, that being said, there's, I mean, we could talk for hours about, uh, you know, the different techniques involved in, in sawing. And I, I have only scratched the surface in my own journey of learning how to be a good sawyer. Uh, part of the, the art and science of sawing is reading the log. And, and trying to maximize the yield of um, high value product from the log. And so there are different techniques you can use and depending on the type of mill you have, um, you know, gives you different, different options. But uh, I tend to, to do live sawing uh, and I'll, I'll describe what that is and why in a minute. But uh, plain sawing usually gives you the, the greatest number of, of usable boards. Quarter sawn gives you the highest quality boards, but takes longer, uh, it's more time consuming, more labor intensive, and therefore more expensive. And then rift sawn gives, is sort of what's left over after quarter sawing. Uh, rift sawn boards are also good, but just of a, of a lower grade, lower quality. Uh, so now why do I do live sawn? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, and I do all of these depending on what the client wants and depending on what the log will yield. But I tend to focus on live sawn because I produce what are called flitches and bowls. Uh, now flitches and bowls are probably a term you're not familiar with, but uh, a flitch is a piece of wood in a series or a sequence of matching pieces. So um, they all come from the same log and they're in the sequence in which they were taken or cut from the log. And a bowl is simply a collection of flitches. So what you're seeing in this picture is, a, uh, is that walnut bowl that, uh, that I showed in the video a few minutes ago. And the reason this is desirable um, in certain situations is because each flitch of this bowl being sourced from the same log has similar characteristics. It's going to be uniform in color, grain, texture, density, moisture content, quality. Um, any defects in the log are, are going to be um, sort of consistent. And um, this is sort of the traditional uh, raw material for woodcrafters. Uh, so this is how you know, 200, 300 years ago, if you were a woodworker, this is how you made your furniture, right? The, the hutch or the cabinet or the table all came, or the grandfather clock, you know, all came from the same log. You didn't, you didn't just run down to the lumber yard and buy a bunch of random pieces from a bunch of random trees and then go home and make your product. product. You, you used, you know, what was available from the logs you know, locally available and things of that nature. And this is still how sort of traditional woodworking is done in Europe and other places. It's not as common here. And I, and I think that's because the amount of work and sort of the unique situation necessary to produce a bowl um, is, is just rare, right? Um, the, the big mills don't do it. And so the lumber yards can't get, get it. And even if they did, there's not enough of an educated consumer base to know the, the advantages or why they would even want it. So I'm sort of hoping that through this webinar and through my efforts to make this sort of to, to educate people about flitches and bowls and the availability of this product, um, that the demand for this thing will go up. But anyway, so this is this is how this is how I tend to produce most of my uh, my milled lumber. Uh, now, why is that also good for live edge tables? Well, one, you can see I've preserved the live edge in every cut, uh, in every flitch. Um, but also because you can produce 
what's called a book matched or sometimes referred to as a butterfly matched piece of furniture. Uh, so what you're seeing in the video here, this is um, a slab where half of the slab was used for a thick mantle. And, uh, and Nathan might even be on the webinar today, but uh, Nathan, if you're out there, hi. Um, so this is for a client. And the other half of the slab, this is a hickory slab, uh, he asked me to rip in two and it's gonna, he's going to use it for some floating shelves to go around the mantle. So it's really neat that, you know, the mantle and the floating shelves will all be coming from the same log. They'll have similar moisture content, similar uh, grain patterns, things of that nature. But also, you know, if, if he wants to produce book matched uh, furniture from this, he can. Anyway, so that's sort of the advantage um, of, of flitches and bowls. And you'll see here, here's another example. If I can get past this video. Uh, another example where a book match piece was put with an insert. Um, and then you'll notice that in this example on the left, the benches are also from the same piece of wood. Uh, so again, that's sort of a unique, uh, a, a unique piece of furniture that you couldn't build if you if you were sourcing exclusively from sort of the commercially available wood hardware stores. So that being said, uh, I'll get into the the drying process. I know we're about seven nine minutes left in the in the webinar, um, so I'll just keep. Wait, did I cover did I cover Mark's question? Was I think it was about metal. Oh no, it was a question uh, about the kiln and, and drying. What is I think you said what are the benefits of air of vacuum drying over air drying? Okay, so let me talk a little bit about vacuum kiln technology versus say solar kiln or traditional um, dehumidification kilns or what it's known as heat kilns. They're all good. Um, it's really about speed and a little bit about quality and simplicity. So um, all the kilns that I know of are, it's better if you air dry before you put them in a kiln. And a kiln is really just meant to finish the process of drying and also to sanitize the wood. Uh, it's important to sanitize the wood because there are little creatures that, that lay their eggs in wood and you don't want a caterpillar or a bug crawling out of your dining room table or out of your kitchen hutch or whatever. So before you go working wood, uh, you want it to be completely dry and sterilized. And so that's where the value of a kiln comes in. Um, vacuum kiln technology is the fastest and safest way to dry wood that I know about. And the reason for that, it's also the, one of the most economic. Uh, not just because of the speed, but the energy requirements are pretty low because uh, if you've ever tried to like make coffee or boil water up in the mountains, uh, you know that water boils at a lower temperature in, in thinner atmosphere, right? And so in a vacuum, it boils pretty quickly or it evaporates, turns into a gas very quickly. So what a vacuum kiln does is it sort of simulates um, the ideal environment for drying wood, which would be at altitude, but also warm, which would be like on Mars. So if we could like simulate drying our wood on Mars, then that's what a vacuum kiln does. At least that's my layperson description. Um, I'm sure Jim at iDry would cringe if he heard me talking about this, but um, that, that's sort of how I interpret the way the vacuum kiln works. Um, it's super simple. This is a picture of the kiln and just sort of giving you a, a sense of scale. Mine is uh, called an iDry Plus, so it's, it's sort of the medium size of the available iDry brand kilns. Uh, iDry is a company up in Vermont They've been making vacuum kilns for commercial dryers for, I think, almost 40 years. The company was started by, by Jim's dad, and Jim's currently running the company. And it's a great family-owned company. They do incredible work. Uh, the build quality is extremely good. The welds 
Um, this is, like I said, it's a 15,000 pound piece of equipment. It's extremely rugged. Um, I can't say enough about the company. If you're interested in, in uh, a vacuum kiln, I would highly recommend you, you check out the uh, idrywood.com and uh, you know and talk to Jim about his product. But uh, there's a smaller one called a standard, and then there's a bigger one called a turbo. And the turbo is really cool because it also has uh, a rubber bladder that lets a little bit of the atmosphere uses the pressure of the atmosphere to push down on the top of the, the, the stack of wood and press it flat so that it's less likely to work. Um, and yes, it is important to have weight or um, straps or some, something to sort of prevent the wood from warping and twisting and moving too much during the drying process. Uh, you're not going to be able to prevent it entirely, and you know there's some debate as to whether or not doing so actually you know creates a problem down the road where that tension is eventually going to come out. It's just going to come out more slowly. Um, I don't know. I haven't been doing it long enough to know for sure, but um, so far the results I've been getting from the wood I've been drying has been you know satisfactory. In fact, I've been thrilled with the results I've been getting. Um, they come out. Uh, with good color, they come out, uh, you know, mostly with no damage or minimized damage, uh, pretty flat, and then, you know, I can work them into uh, furniture and have done so um, with quite a bit of what's come out of my kiln. Uh, so that being said, uh, one of the challenging parts is loading the kiln. Um, I'm still I'm still working on a better way to do this, but uh, this is a picture or a video of me and my son, uh, one of my sons, sort of pushing this uh, beast into the kiln. Uh, it's easier to load than it is to unload because it's it, there's a slight slope towards the back. Um, that way, when water sort of evaporates off the wood, it can collect and drain. But um, pulling this same thing out, even though it's lighter because it's dry, it isn't easy. So I'm, I'm working on some kind of mechanical winch type mechanism. But uh, even that being said, it, it's not terribly bad uh, because the, the trolley that this rides on is, is pretty well balanced. Um, so that's, that's the loading process. Um, and then a couple of other things to know about the kiln I'm trying to get past this video um, you want you want to fill it up you, because it's uh it uses air uh, you'll see the fan in the lower right with the uh, the heating elements it blows air around the kiln and so if you have big voids in the kiln um, the air is going to follow the path of least resistance and it's not going to you know the the low pressure is going to go go to the low pressure and the high pressure it's not it's not going to go through the wood so you'll see I've used I use this pink styrofoam to baffle the wood um, to baffle the air, but uh, that's sort of important. But ideally, you want to fill it up as much as you can. And uh, and Bob, if you're on, uh, that's your oak on the bottom of that uh, picture there. That's that's your oak slabs uh, under all that weight, I'm trying to keep them flat while we dry them. All right. Uh, let's see what else about. Oh, so I'll, I will do at three minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video. This is uh, the empty kiln. I'm going to just walk into the kiln. Uh, it's basically a, a big stainless steel box. Um, the it's half inch thick stainless steel plate. And then at the back, there's a baffle. And that's the, uh, the propeller blade for the fan and the heating elements. Uh, so the way this works, there's a vacuum pump on the other side behind it, and it'll pull a vacuum, and then it will heat up, and the fan comes on for a couple hours, and then it will cut off, and then it will reverse and blow the other direction for a couple hours, and then once a night or however often I set it, it will release the vacuum, and then open the drain valve, drain out any of the water that is collected. Uh, during that cycle, and then close the valve, pull a vacuum, and start the whole process over again. Um, and this particular kiln will get up to 180 degrees, 
you only really need 160 degrees for a few hours of core, you know, core temperature to, to sterilize wood, but it will go up to 180 if I needed to. Um, I do tend to sort of do a low power for the first few days to a week. Um, so I, I don't go right to 160. So we work our way up from 100, 110, 120, 130, 40, 50, 60 uh, over the first week. Uh, drying it a little slower, less likely to shock the wood, just uh, preserve the quality. Uh, so that's that's the kiln. And then I hope I answered the question there about the kiln. Um, I will point out that kiln board feet is a little different than just traditional board feet in that, um, you know, wacky shaped pieces, live edge pieces, bowls, they all take up more space in the kiln than than just the technical volume of wood, like you would see in an industrial setting. And so um, I do I did sort of coin this term kiln board feet to help my customers understand that when they're leasing space in my kiln, they're leasing the footprint that their wood requires, um, not exactly the board foot measurement of their wood. And so that's sort of an important concept to understand. And then I mentioned drying. So a good moisture meter is important. Uh, this one dries, has specific, I mean, 42 different species, and it also has adjustment for temperature. So if I'm checking the wood and it's fresh out of the kiln at 140 degrees, I need my, mortar, my moisture meter to know that so that I get an accurate reading versus if I'm, I'm checking it at room temperature, you know, outdoor temperature, 70 degrees. Uh, that being said, I will just quickly say that the other fun part about my job is working with wood and turning it into furniture. I'm not gonna play all these extra videos because we're out of time, but um, this, I just wanna show sort of a couple of, of pieces, finished pieces. And here we go. So this is the kitchen island that I actually made for my wife. Um, and it's one of the few like show pieces I have. Almost everything I make gets sold. Um, but this one is a show piece available. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to see what a live edge kitchen island looks like. This is a uh, spalted quarter sawn sycamore. And then, uh, you know, here's, here's some white oak that we use to make a step in the store and uh, a live edge piece of sycamore for a client. This, this was an interesting project because the, the slab warped pretty significantly during the drying process. And so we had to create relief cuts on the bottom and wedge and use epoxy to fill, but we were able to straighten that sucker back out um, and it created you know, an absolutely beautiful table and the client was very happy. Uh, the other the, the other great part about my job is the customers I get to meet. So I'll just say real quick, I never sort of when I set out to do the woodworking, I was you know in love with the woodworking and the idea of working outside. I didn't realize how much of my time would be spent in in marketing and sort of business administration. But um, the best part of that about that is the customers. So uh, I had a customer actually uh, give me a pecan pie, homemade pecan pie, which made me very happy. Um, and then this lovely family, uh, this gentleman brought his whole family out to, to pick the wood that they wanted to use for their, for their new kitchen table for their home. And so it was sort of a, a whole family affair. And the kids came out and they saw the alpacas and they had a good time. And I just love meeting the customers and, and interacting with people over social media. So with that said, I realize that I'm four minutes over our allotted time. I'll just give you my contact information and I'm happy to stay on and take questions for as long as people are willing to, to hang out. Uh, and as long as, as Mindy is uh, willing to keep the WebEx open. But with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up and see if there are any uh, last minute questions. Thank you so much, Avery. That was a great, great presentation. And we understand some people probably need to hop off at this point. Um, when you exit, you will be prompted to um, a quick survey. If you don't mind quickly doing that for us, it will help us determine what kinds of uh, urban wood programming we want to do in the future. And also the last question, if you need that 
um, one continuing education credit. It will give you a spot to put in your information so we can take care of that for you. Um, otherwise, yes, I'll stay on, Avery. We'll just go ahead and cover the rest of these questions. Um, for those people who want to stick around and listen, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, the picture of you with your son. Someone wanted to know if that was a black walnut that you were that you're working with there. Uh, the one with him on the mill? No, I believe that was a red oak. All right, that was easy enough to answer. Um, also, do you have to replace the blades in your sawmill often because of all the metal damage? Ah, yes, indeed I do. Uh, I consider it a cost of doing business. Uh, so if I miss a piece of metal uh, and I hit it with the, the sawmill, it does, uh, it usually ruins the blade. Uh, sometimes it'll break the blade right away. Um, other times, It'll just uh, chip a couple of teeth or dull it. Um, if I hit a lead bullet, I'm able to pull the blade off and sharpen it myself. But if I hit, uh, you know, steel, you know, ten penny nails, things of that nature, it ruins the blade. Uh, my blades are about fifty dollars a piece, and so it's not the end of the world, but it certainly hurts whenever I do that. Um, but like I said, if it's a high high value piece of wood. It's just factored into the, the cost of, of the uh, finished product. I will say that the blades by themselves, uh, it's also a wear item. So um, a blade, I can get somewhere between nine and 12 hours of cutting from a single blade. That's if I stop every two to three hours and sharpen it. If I just try to use it until it's dull, uh, I get about six hours of cutting out of it before it breaks. Okay, great. Um, next question is, um, Kevin noticed there were some interesting stickers on the flitch and bull side. Do you purchase those? Yes, I do. Uh, those stickers are a, a manufactured product that are pressed. They're super dry, they're pressed, and they're fluted. And so they, um, the advantage of those are they are uh, very consistent in thickness, and uh, I can reuse them many times unless I break them. And um, because they have very little uh, contact with the wood or minimal contact with the wood, they sort of maximize the airflow. It's really important on the higher value woods uh, to have a consistent stickering process, uh, consistent width all the way across so that you don't introduce any bending or warping unnecessarily. That particular product I buy through iDry. You can get it directly from the manufacturer. iDry doesn't mark it up. They just um, they just process the order and, and it's a pass-through cost, uh, I believe. But um, I buy it by the pallet, uh, 1,500 stickers. Uh, I believe are they're about a dollar fifty a piece. I do on the pine and other low, call it lower quality woods. I make my own stickers from uh, from the waste product from the log, and so I'll just accumulate enough sort of edge pieces, and I'll make the stickers like for pine. Whenever I'm milling pine, um, it's less important. Uh, the other nice thing about those stickers is that because they're dry and because there's very little contact with the wood because they're fluted, uh, you don't get sticker stain, which is a problem when you're using even wood from the same log, you end up getting sticker stain on uh, on the slabs. So that was sort of a long-winded answer, but I love, I love that product and I think it's well worth the, the cost of those manufactured stickers. Okay, great. Thanks, Avery. Um, Joe has a question. Are your costs and the charge to the customer for drying in a vacuum kiln going to be more than with other kiln types? Uh, I would say probably yes. Um, what you're paying, the, the premium you're paying for the vac to, to do it in a vacuum kiln is for the speed and, you know, I, I think quality, but I it's true that, that other drying methods produce very high quality results. 
So I do think you can get just as good a quality from a solar kiln or a traditional dehumidification kiln. Um, my expenses are also higher because I'm a low volume producer. So um, one of my clients made me aware there's, a, there's an industrial size kiln somewhere around the area uh, and that they're drying for like 10, 15 cents a board foot. Um, but you sort of get in line behind their industrial clients, and it, but if you're not in a hurry, that's probably a cheaper way to dry um, than using my kiln. All right. Um, let's see. I think we just have one more question, um, and that's do the eye dry kilns need to be inside a conditioned space? Uh, yes, they do. They're they're not built to be outside and what so they're not waterproof um and uh, it they need to be inside an insulated space it doesn't necessarily have to be a heated and conditioned space so um in my situation i'm in actually in the process of enclosing and insulating that kiln what i'm calling the kiln shed and um i'm just using some two inch foam you know, from, from Home Depot or Lowe's uh, around as insulation. But it, yeah, it does need to be uh, kept dry and ideally in some kind of uh, insulated space. And the kiln also requires, in addition to electricity, so it, it requires about a, a 60 amp, uh, 220 volt service, single phase. It also requires uh, water. Uh, so you have to plumb a water supply because the vacuum pump uses water in both the process of pulling a vacuum and to keep the vacuum pump cool while it's operating. It doesn't use a lot of water, but uh, you do need a water supply in addition to the electricity. Okay, great. Um, I think that's it. If I've missed any other questions, I apologize. Um, Avery's contact information is is there on the closing slide you can go ahead and and i'm sure avery would welcome anyone contacting him directly or even to just network